The Tom Woods Show, Episode 700. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. If you're a homeschooling parent and you're tired of running yourself ragged, then check out the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. And check it out through my special link where you get three free bonuses totaling $160. My special link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here for episode 700. And of course, any episode with two zeros at the end has to be a particularly special one. And this one is no exception. I'm going to be having a sort of freewheeling discussion with Jeff Deist, who is a formerly chief of staff for Ron Paul, and he is currently the president of the Mises Institute. And we're going to talk about what's going on in the world today and in America and American politics. And then segue into a discussion of what I consider to be the most enjoyable week of the year, the week that I guess probably more than anything else helped to make me the person I am today, which is the Mises University week, the week of the great instructional summer program that the Mises Institute puts on for college students every year. And they've made it available to the general public through the internet, and it's a tremendous thing. And it's a lot of fun to talk about for reasons I think you will see and appreciate. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tom. Good to be here. We have, by the time people hear this, just completed the Republican convention. And um, I did do an episode with Murray Sabrin on that because I thought, well, it is pretty topical. And although I avoid some topics uh, that are in the news, this one I guess I've got to hit head on. We had a pretty good conversation but uh, I guess we're about to go into the Democratic convention in the not-too-distant future. Uh, I can't wait till the whole thing's all over, but it, when you look at Trump and you look at Hillary and you look at the people supporting them and the types of issues they raise and the way they raise them and the way they propose to solve them, what's a libertarian to make of it all? Well, it's very tough, Tom. I did not tune in to the RNC. I tried to avoid it and get – I get my info from Drudge and from Justin Romando on Twitter and people like that. But my wife did tune in and watch a bit of it and I have to say a very, very bad show. I, I do get a chuckle though at this criticism of Trump that he didn't have uh, W or George Bush Sr. or Mike Huckabee or any of these supposed luminaries in the GOP willing to speak at his convention. As though anybody wants to hear those complete bores uh, ever again. And, and as though that isn't looking in the rearview mirror. I, th I thought it was it was great that uh, that yeah, either Trump snubbed them or they snubbed Trump. It matters not. I think it's 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 healthy for America to put those people and Cheney especially in the rearview mirror. But you know, I get a lot of questions about this, about Hillary and Trump and who's worse. And I very much understand, and I think many libertarians do not understand, the great benefit that Trump has provided in putting a shiv in the remnants of the modern GOP. And for that, I think he deserves tremendous credit. This has nothing to do with his ideological outlook or anything else. So I get a little tired of people saying, oh, you're a libertarian for Trump to saying that, not to me, but to someone like Walter Block or Lou Rockwell. They're, they're not understanding and they're purposely not understanding. But here's why I tell people that they, they, they can't get emotionally attached to, to Hillary or to Trump or even to Gary Johnson and that they, in my opinion anyway, shouldn't vote for any of those three. And it's, it's very simple. At some point, regardless of who wins, regardless of your take on the lesser of evils argument, which applies equally to Gary Johnson, I might add, regardless of your take on that, at some point, whoever is president is going to order bombs to be dropped somewhere. And at some point, the person for whom you pulled the lever is going to be responsible for a, a young child somewhere, probably in the Islamic world, laying there with, with his arm blown off or, or something like this. And, and I think that no libertarian ought to, to live with that or to give that his or her sanction. So that, that's why I try very hard to be emotionally detached from this, to, to view things as they are and, and to simply not vote, it, not as some great noble – uh, a gesture on my part, but just as a tiny drip, another drop in the bucket, hopefully, of people who don't sanction this whole sordid affair. It's, it's, it's unworthy of us, and more importantly, it's unworthy of our ancestors, the people who came here and, and, and 
worked much, much harder than we do physically to create this material abundance we still have around us, thankfully. So it, a, a very ugly show, a very bad show. And, you know, the best thing we can do, Tom, in my view, is to tune out. Yeah, that's, I think it's best in terms of the most productive thing you can do. It's also good for your mental health because it's it's demoralizing, frankly, to look around and see that so many of your fellow Americans think a certain way. I mean, and particularly with the Republicans, I mean, they've had, I don't care if it's Trump or Cruz or whoever these people that they might have nominated, Jeb Bush, whatever, whatever it is, these people have had eight years of Obama, eight years to learn something by watching Obama, by watching the federal government. They've had eight years to go to seminars, to be educated, to read books. And after eight years, the best they can come up with is, we just need another guy who waves a, a larger flag to to be in there. And that's the best they can come up with. There's been no fundamental insight, despite the fact there's information all over the internet, one mouse click away, the best they can think of is, well, we just have to play the political game a little bit differently from the way that guy played it. Yeah, you know what? You need a whole shift in your thinking. And that, if I may make a ham-handed segue here, that frankly is what the Mises Institute's Mises University program did for me when I, in the early 1990s. When I got to the Mises University program the summer before my senior year in college, I was the vice president – of the Harvard College Republicans. That's where I was when I got there. When I got out of there, it was only a week later, I was very much shaken. I was not immediately converted, although actually, no, I, I pretty much wanted to resign as the head of the Republican Club or, or the vice president anyway. Uh, but it eventually it sank in, took, took a while, but it sank in and, and it changed me. It ultimately, it was the catalyst that changed me. And now, are we on year 31? What year are we on for that program now? Yeah, we are on about year 31 and almost 35 years of the Institute itself. But I'm curious in that pre-internet uh, age or early internet age of 1992, how you managed to find uh, Mises University and how you decided to come being a, a young Republican, as you say. I actually saw an ad in a magazine, okay. if you can believe that. And it, I don't know, it might even have been Reason Magazine. I mean, there weren't a whole lot of libertarian magazines, and so I was getting whatever I could because at that by that time I was at least open to listening to other free market-ish points of view. I had gone to another week-long seminar the previous year that had gotten me thinking a little bit, and then I – I just – the prospect of learning economics for a week was so thrilling to me that I just immediately said, I got to do this. And, you know, I I am on the 100th episode of the uh, Johnny Rocket uh, podcast, and this is – and I reveal this on that episode as well. I was talking about how I first heard about Murray Rothbard. Now, I know I'm sort of interviewing you, Jeff, but – I think when when you're on the show, we're just having a conversation. But I've never, I don't think I've ever told anybody how I first heard about Rothbard. You remember Bill Buckley did that long essay in search of anti-Semitism in the early '90s, and he criticized Pat Buchanan and Joe Sobrin and The Nation magazine and one or two other people. And then they ran like a round table of responses to the essay as a special insert in a later issue of National Review. And one of the responses was they took. Uh, Murray's wonderful John Randolph Club speech from 1992, and they just pulled the portion about Buckley and National Review. And so I read this. I had never heard of Murray Rothbard before, but I, I read National Review cover to cover in those days. I was just a kid, so I read it. And here's Rothbard basically coming out as vastly more free market than Buckley, that Buckley was a total sellout of the movement. And my jaw hit the floor, Jeff. I, I, I thought, What? There's somebody more free market than Buckley, and Buckley. Some I couldn't get over this. I couldn't get this out of my head. And then I put two and two together when uh, I applied for Mises U. I realized, wait a minute, this Rothbard character is all over this Mises program. And so then I said, okay, yeah, I've got to check this out. So National Review actually drove me into the arms of Rothbard and the Mises Institute. So how about that? Well, I have to say that National Review and Bill Buckley, in a very roundabout way, have a lot to do with why the Mises Institute and Mises University exist. You know, if we look back at the 20th century, around 
the uh, after the First World War, and especially getting in the 1930s, the left took over completely academia. And what was left was the, the great remnant of what we now call the old right. And that was later attacked by the Buckleyite neoconservatives who wanted the right to be obsessed with the Cold War and with the former Soviet Union. So in doing so, they jettisoned a lot of great libertarian principles that used to be considered part and parcel of being a right winger in this country. And they created this sort of uh, new group of academic and think tank organizations that have come to dominate the 20th, late 20th century, now 21st century. And one of the uh, bulwarks of that was to find a, a cohort of free market professors who were malleable on matters of war, on matters of welfareism, um, on matters of wealth distribution, that sort of thing. And so in a sense, uh, both the conservative and libertarian sphere attempted to make Hayek Friedrich Hayek was, of course, a very great thinker and, and just a, a superb mind. They tried to make him into the this, this safe Austrian, right? If you read, obviously, The Road to Serfdom, he talks uh, about some things that make libertarians uncomfortable, like the, his willingness to entertain some sort of global government, for example. And then, well, I guess, about 15 odd years later, he writes The Constitution of Liberty, where in, in some senses, he doubles down in part three of that book with his acquiescence to certain amounts of government intervention in the form of a safety net, in the form of uh, national defense, so-called, et cetera. So I think that the the Beltway really seized on this, and they really seized on Hayek. And this is something that even up to today, organizations like Cato and Mercatus, they really push Hayek to the fore, and they've they've grudgingly and slowly come to terms with Mises as as a giant and as a great intellectual of the 20th century, even Mises' greatest enemies, uh, you know, someone like a, a, a John Kenneth Galbraith, perhaps in the past, maybe a Krugman today, would I think grudgingly admit his impact on free market thought. But because of his intransigence, both in terms of his ide ideology, his work, and his, pr his professional life, he never quite reached that level of acceptability of Hayek. And I think that a lot of the, the Beltway libertarian organizations and a lot of the Beltway conservative organizations went in a purposely Hayekian direction to be more palatable uh, and to be less intransigent. And the Mises Institute uh, was, was formed really to make sure that Mises got his due, that, that Mises continued uh, to be read, that, that his works were kept alive, that his thought uh, earned its rightful place in the free market pantheon. And what's ironic is you fast forward and we're kind of in the same situation today, Tom, with Rothbard. There's, there's a lot of people who would like to see Rothbard's work and Rothbard's legacy sort of uh, put off to the side and diminished. And we're working very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen, that, that Rothbard doesn't get the uh, shabby treatment that they attempted to give Mises. So, you know, here we are in the 21st century. We're still fighting these same dopey battles uh, against collectivism, against socialism. Well, dopey in the intellectual sense, obviously very vicious in the in the practical sense. Uh, we're we're still we're still trying to convince people of things that have been proven ad nauseum by thinkers and scholars far smarter than most of us. Uh, but it's it's interesting that that the schism. That uh, that Mises and Hayek represented the schism can still be felt today, and I think, obviously, the, the, I'm biased, and this is a personal opinion, but I think we are going to find that it, it is the intransigent thinkers, it is the the most principled, the most unyielding thinkers, who maybe not in their lifetimes, but in the long run, actually have the greater impact. In other words, is is it is it tactically better to uh, stick to a Hayekian approach and try to uh, impact legislation or public policy in Washington? Or is it better tactically to stick to a more radical Misesian or Rothbardian approach and really strike at the root of, of what ails us? Well, I guess that's an open question and libertarians can decide for themselves. But obviously, you know that I favor the latter. You know, I know it's not fair to Mises to put it quite this way, but in a way, I feel like Rothbard makes Mises look like Hayek, if you follow what I'm saying. I mean, he is really, really totally hardcore, and so, of course, he puts these people off even more, and I'm going to link on the show notes page of this episode. This is episode 700, so it's tomwoods.com slash 700. I'm going to link to my talk 
on what I called the anti-Rothbard cult. I actually delivered that talk at the Mises Institute as an informal series of comments. But you look at the think tanks and the you know the the major outlets, and Rothbard is basically not mentioned or is criticized. Whereas they just can't talk enough about Milton Friedman, 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 Friedman. Now Friedman was a smart guy, and nobody takes uh, his accomplishments away from him. But it's just odd that. As I said to Lou Rockwell once, for every 100 mentions of Friedman, there are zero mentions of Rothbard. It's not like there's one to one. There's nothing. He's just not a person. And yet I remember when I first went to the Urmesis University program back in 93, they introduced all the faculty in alphabetical order except Rothbard was out of alphabetical order. They introduced him at the end. And even before there was really an internet or people could go online and find out about Rothbard, that – auditorium of students, they stood on their feet and roared for Rothbard. And he's a guy who, for most of his life, was teaching in a school that didn't even have an economics department. And yet somehow, because of that intransigence, because of that hard work, he became that well-known. Of course, he had a falling out with National Review because he was anti-Vietnam War, anti-Cold War. And I have to say, uh, in all seriousness and humility, Jeff, that when I look at Rothbard's example in the 60s, I wonder to myself sometimes, would I have been able to be that faithful to the ideas, or would I have just kind of downplayed the war issue and said, well, you know, they're good on the minimum wage, so I'll keep, you know, I'll try and keep my uh, bridges to, to them. He just didn't care about that, and he didn't care that he he was writing for small newsletters after that. He just had to keep the message pure. Yeah. It's impossible not to respect that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think when you come to Mises U, you will get a real flavor of Rothbard. I know you got to experience him live and in the flesh as a student. Um, I, I, can't, um, I can only imagine what he was like. I, I did get to sit in uh, on one of his classes at UNLV – an evening class when he was teaching there in the early 90s. But that's the sum of my uh, personal exposure to Rothbard. But from what I'm told, he was just absolutely indefatigable. He could just, you know, teach classes and talk to students till well into the night and uh, always had a very cheerful, optimistic spirit. So it's a, it's interesting how his reputation is attempted to be sullied by some. But we, we always find that when people say, oh, you, you know, Rothbard's this or Hoppe's that and you shouldn't read them. And nobody has to agree with everything Rothbard says or Hoppe says or Mises says. I mean, this this a accusation of cult-like thinking, well, if Austrian economics is a cult, it's the worst cult ever. <laughs> because all we do is fight. I mean, Menger, Menger you know, comes along and understands subjective value. Mises has to come along and could correct him completely about applying that to money. Rothbard has to come along and completely correct Mises about utilitarian ethics. Uh, you know, there's these huge rifts and huge disagreements. So uh, again, when, when people try to denigrate a Rothbard or a Hoppe, despite obviously acknowledging their their brilliance or their their effectiveness as writers and thinkers, it, you know, there's no requirement that says you have to agree with everything that someone says. I'm not very comfortable with Rothbard on on evictionism, in the abortion debate, for example. Okay, but th th that's fine. And I I often wonder if when people try to to criticize or actually steer young people away from certain readers, that they don't just read them more as a result. I mean, if if I was at at, uh, at a young person and, and some adult was telling me, oh, you know, you don't want to read Rothbard. It seems to me that's the first thing I would read. It would be re like reading Charles Bukowski or Hunter S. Thompson or something like that, the forbidden fruit, albeit of, of economics. So um, the, the idea that, that we court controversy, uh, that we're intransigent and that we're just doing this sort of thing out of spite when we ought to be sort of going along to get along and, and working with other organizations better to promote something. Well, the question becomes to promote what? And then the question becomes, has trying to influence public policy really worked? From where I sit, Austrian economics has grown tremendously over the last 30 years. Can you really point at least at the federal level to any great legislative successes over the last 30 years, there's been some minor successes, I think, at the state level with medical marijuana and the like. But it's awfully hard to point to to a libertarian success in, in public policy in the last 30 years. You can point to a lot of status successes. Uh, so, you know, I think people who 
think that compromise is the way to go need to be judged just as critically on results as they are on 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 rhetoric and niceties. Tell me about the uh, what exactly goes on at the Mises University program because it's 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 not only is it something that students attend, but you've made it so that the general public can actually more or less, at least from their own homes, have the same experience that the students in the room are having. Well, look, if you come to Mises U, you're going to know more about economics in one week than you're ever going to learn in undergraduate uh, econ classes. You're going to know more than 99% of the general public walking the street. So if you do nothing more than attend Mises U in your PJs uh, online, um, here and there over the course of the week, you're already way ahead of the game. So let me put it that way. And and frankly, I think the, the great thing about Mises U is it helps some students identify a passion for economics and a desire to become an academic or professional economist. And it also helps some students identify a, a dislike for economics, the idea that this really isn't for me as a career path. So I think the time to do that or to figure that out is when you're young. But what you'll find in all of our classes is is what's so tragically missing in university settings today, but not just at the undergraduate level, even in PhD programs. And that is this lack of awareness of the history of economic thought. When our profs come and teach, because they're Austrians, trust me, they are all painfully aware of, of where the Austrian school sort of stands in historical context. But you can go all the way through an econ program today and get obtain a PhD basically not knowing a single thing about the history of economic thought. It's as though econ students today are just parachuted into some uh, neoliberal, neo-Keynesian island where you know no other information and no history exists. And they just b- begin to build uh, econometric models and learn a bunch of 700-level math and, and go from there. It, it, it's a real shame. It, it's an absolute tragedy. Uh, so you will find at Mises U that our professors really imbue the classes with a sense of context. You, you know, here's here's what Hayek was saying. Here's what Mises was saying. Here's what Menger was saying. But in the context of the things that were going on around, on around them. And so, you know, we, we take the whole of, of economics, we break it down into some silos, some categories just to help students wrestle with this beast. And, and I'm telling you – in just a week, you'll know more about money. You'll know more about uh, about real methodology in economics, not math methodology. You'll know more about about capital and interest and the structure of production and and business cycles and the roles of banks and all this. You'll know you'll know more about uh, Keynes and monetarists and supply siders. Uh, really, really a great week, I, and I think it changes a lot of young people's lives. And from our perspective, Tom, we would rather bring, let's say, 150 kids to Mises U and really, really reach and affect 10 of them, let's say, to the point where it it changes their life. They go on to do things in the business or academic worlds that affect people. You know, we would much rather do that than try to chase clicks on our website by having trendier content or sexier content. In other words, we we really want to be the the stake and not the sizzle. We we want to be the the more rigorous end of the libertarian movement, um, the economics end of the libertarian movement, and, and and the end where people say, look, to be to be an effective advocate for liberty, you actually have to do some work. You know, you have to actually know a little bit what you're talking about, and and that doesn't just mean. Uh, spending your day on Instagram. There's a price to be paid for being a competent uh, advocate for anything. And part of that price is to, is to read some books from some, written by some old dead guys uh, who in most cases are smarter than the reader, no offense, and, uh, and to learn something. The a- academic rigor and intellectual rigor, there's no substitute for it. And if, and if you want to see what the opposite yields – Go look at the Republican and Democratic conventions. That what Ayn Rand used to famously call blanking out. That that's there's a whole bunch of blanking out going on and a whole bunch of platitudes being thrown around. And the fact that our society, Western society, is so gullible and so willing to fall for this crap is is an indictment, I think, of all of us in in our failure to do the work and and to understand uh, the concepts beneath it all. I love this week so much. I look forward to it every year, and it's it happens to be the case that Bob Murphy, who also teaches on the faculty there, and I have an expression 
that Bob coined for how you feel Saturday afternoon, the day Mises U ends. And he calls it post Mises U depression. And I, I get it too. I get it too. It's not quite um, recognized as a clinical problem, but I, I'm telling you, I feel it, that that there's so much excitement. It's such a thrill. And then, oh, I have to wait another year for another one of these. It, it's, I don't feel that way about anything else. That's it really, it's a, I, I know this is sappy, but it's a very special time. Now, you've made a, uh, it possible for people to follow the lectures, get the slides, get the readings, and be taking part in it, even from their own homes, for 20 bucks. I have a special deal for my listeners. I've got it up at tomwoods.com slash 700, where uh, I'll pay the 20 bucks for you because I want you to get access to it. So you can check that out over there. Judge Napolitano has been part of the program for several years. You won't get his content because he doesn't allow recording, uh, partly because he doesn't want his actual, you know, he's a professor at a law school uh, when he's not at Fox. He doesn't want his students to be getting all the answers, you know, and finding out what he's teaching there. So you're, that you won't get, but the students, an elite group of students, are about to have a tremendous experience because I, you know, I, like you, we've saw, seen the judge on TV, we've heard him speak, and he's very impressive. But you haven't really experienced the true, the full fullness of the judge until you're sitting there in a law school style seminar where he's walking around the room and calling on students and engaging them, and you say this guy is in total command of this material. Yeah, he absolutely is, and and the uh, what he teaches, of course, is the, a, a course entitled. Uh, the Constitution and the Free Market, and and he gets into a lot of these famous landmark cases dealing with the Commerce Clause and how it's been uh, interpreted in nonsensical ways, uh, the General Welfare Clause, but also some of the great uh, economic substantive due process cases that really changed uh, the the forever and ever the landscape, the legal landscape in America and allowed government regulation to go far, far, far beyond uh, what was ever intended in Article 1, Section 8. So uh, we even have some lawyers who come uh, and, and get CLE credit for attending. It's it's pretty hardcore and, and as friendly as he is, he does ask people to stand up and answer using the Socratic method and those of you who went to law school will be familiar with that. So uh, a pr- pretty intense week and uh, you know, we're very, very thankful of course that he comes here, that, he, that he's a member of our board and that he's, he's willing to, to do so much and give so much of his time. Um, another guy that we could call indefatigable just like Rothbard. Absolutely. I'm so looking forward. I'm going to try to attend as many of his sessions as I can. Because the past couple of times I've been at Mises U, I've been busy with other projects. So during presentations, I'm working on a book or I'm doing this or that. Enough of that. I want to sit and enjoy it this time. And I've already gotten the judge's permission to sit in on his sessions. Uh-oh. My, my 13 year old, but I'm not going to say a word. My 13 year old is going to be with me and we're just going to sit there and absorb it all, which is kind of fun because I'm not sure I want to be called on by the judge. So I'll, I'll let the, the students do that. All right. Any parting words? Well, again, anybody who wants to watch online, just come to Mises.org and you can see all the info you want there under events, uh, Mises University. And also be thinking about it if you're a young person or not so young person, be thinking about your next summer. Um, we have the occasional 40 or 50 something who comes to Auburn and spends a week with us. And we have the occasional uh, stay at home mom or a truck driver who makes time in his schedule, uh, that sort of thing. So while most of our students are undergraduates. We have non-traditional students who benefit as well. But the the bottom line is you're never too uh, young, you're never too old to be to be learning about economics because it it really is the stuff of all human action. It underpins everything we do and it relates to all science in that sense. So, uh, you know, I really encourage you and if you're listening and you have kids, high school or junior high kids even, uh, might, might benefit from at least some of the lectures. Uh, you know, you can pick and choose and the syllabus will be online. And what I will do is uh, I'll link to the because if I just link to one Mises U, then people listen to this a year, year later, that link won't be super helpful. So I'm just going to link to the events page at the Mises Institute because there will always be Mises U up there for the current year, the following year. You can find it. You can look at the schedule. You can look at the faculty uh, at Mises.org slash events. So I'll, I'll link there. Jeff, uh, great talking to you and uh, looking forward to seeing you. All right. Thanks, Tom. All right. That's going to do it for today and for the week Of course, as you know, I'm going to be in Alabama next week, obviously, given what I just got done saying. 
but there will be episodes running in my absence. How about that? Not only have I come roaring back with five episodes a week, but I've even prepared five additional episodes for you to enjoy while I am enjoying my favorite week of the year. So everybody's going to be happy next week. I hope you'll tune in for uh, the Virtual Mises University, my special deal where I'll pay the 20 bucks for you. Uh, you can find that out again at tomwoods.com slash 700. Now, after Mises University Week is over, I'll take that offer down because it would just be cruel to be offering something like that when there is no Mises University happening. So if you listen to this later and then you go there and there's nothing there, that's what happened. But check it out, tomwoods.com slash 700. That's good only through July 25th, and then I'm taking that offer down. All right. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.